Asqui Kwasani Tampawag, and welcome back to another episode of Tampawag Museum's Children's Hour. So this week, I have a really exciting special guest that's going to share a story with you. And you may remember this guest from past children's hours. She used to be one of our educators at the museum, and I know she was a favorite with so many. And she was really happy to be able to make this video, and we're really excited to be able to show it to you. So I'm going to share my screen. Wake up. You're going to want to see this. Uh, no. And today's lesson is all about birds. The Narragansett word for birds is Nepeshawag. Can you say Nepeshawag? Nepeshawag. Nepeshawag. <laughs> birds. So here's a picture of a turkey, and we have a picture of a beautiful beaded crown that was made by an artist, uh, Najiba Miles, and she's Navajo and Mohegan. And we were able to have this crown on display at the museum. We're really excited to be able to have a lot of her beautiful beadwork there. And so I wanted to share this picture with you so you can see how birds are influenced in our artwork. So today's special story is coming from Lindsay Montanari, Teacher Lindsay. So Teacher Lindsay used to be an educator at the museum and she's excited to be able to share this story with you. So without any further ado, this is the story of how birds got their song. Natasmis Lindsay, a English set, Natasmis Wama Sukataram, a Nahayagansa, Katabatash, what she adusata mean yukisa. So, what I said there was hi, my name is Lindsay in English, my name is Wama Sukatan or Loving Sea in the Narragansett language, and thank you so much for listening to me today. So, I am a member of the Narragansett tribe, and today I'm going to be sharing with you one of our traditional stories How Bird Got Its Song. Many, many moons ago, Katantra, the creator, was walking through the Wata when he came across the Narragansett people singing their morning song. And as he was listening, he looked around and he could see that all the birds were in the trees listening to the Narragansett song as well. And that's when he realized, I have forgotten something. I have forgotten to give the birds a song. And so he called to all the birds in the trees, Peshawag Pionch, birds come here. And when they were gathered around, he told them, I have forgotten to give you a song. And so, if you meet me here tomorrow at sunrise, tell all the birds you know, I will give you all the gift of song. And the birds were so excited, for they had dreamed of this day every morning. They had awoken with the sunrise, just hoping to hear the Narragansett sing their beautiful song and wishing and dreaming that one day they could have one as well. And the birds, they called their mothers and their grandmothers and everyone they knew, they said, Nuka, I am going to get a song. You are going to get a song. We are going to get a song. And the next day, there were so many birds in the trees that some of the trees were bent over. And that's how we got our weeping willow tree. Now, when all the birds were gathered, Katantwit came walking in and he announced to the birds, today, I will give you a song. What you shall do, is line up, and when it is your turn, you will fly up into Sky World as high as you can, and that will determine what song you get. So each bird got their turn. The jay went, jay, jay, jay. The chickadee, chickadee, chickadee. Excuse me, I'm not too good at bird songs. <laughs> oh, actually had beautiful white feathers until he was caught smoking in the tobacco fields. And everybody knows that smoking is not good for you. And so his feathers got covered in the black from the smoke. And when it was his turn, he tried to fly as high as he could, but he couldn't get too far into <coughs> caw, caw, caw. Everybody knows 
you shouldn't smoke. <laughs> One by one, those birds were going. Next came the hummingbird, and she knew she could not fly as high as Chickadee or the Blue Jay, but she was going to try her hardest, and she flapped her wings as hard as she could. And her song did not come from her mouth, but instead came from the hum of her flapping her wings and her trying her hardest. Now, meanwhile, while all this was going on, the little woodland thrush was getting a little bit nervous. You see, she had always wanted a song. She had dreamed of it more than anyone. She just knew that she needed to have a beautiful song, but she could not fly as high as Blue Jay. And she could not end up with a song like Crow. She was just so nervous. What was she to do? And that's when she got an idea. She saw it eagle great eagle step in front of her and she thought i will climb up into the back of his neck feathers and when great eagle flies and right when he is about to turn around i will jump out of the back of his neck feathers and i will fly into sky world and i will get the most beautiful song and so that's what she did she crept into the back of his neck feathers and when it was eagle's turn off he went whoosh 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 flying high above any of the birds where they had gone and he made it almost to sky world and he could have gone up to sky world but he realized he'd already flown higher than any of the other birds and he didn't want to embarrass them and right as he started to turn around the woodland thrush jumped out of the back of his neck feathers and flew up into sky world and when she got there she was so excited i must have the most beautiful song and so she sat there and she practiced her mewies and her la la la's until they were perfect of course nobody is perfect but you couldn't tell the woodland thrush that and there she went so excited she flew down singing her song all the way and she was really excited until of course she started to see the birds faces and when she landed she realized that all the birds were looking at her and she felt embarrassed for they all knew that she had cheated and so she hung her head down low and she walked off into the wata now you can only ever hear the woodland thrush's song if you go out deep into the woods when she thinks nobody is listening. And then she sings. Panivre, the end. That was fantastic, huh? Lindsay's a good storyteller. You got a little nervous at the end of that story, huh? Were you a little embarrassed for Thrush? Yeah. Thrush was embarrassed too. She was so embarrassed that she had cheated to get the most beautiful song. And that's why she hid in the woods so no one can hear her unless they go deep in the woods to listen to her sing. And you can check out that story in a cool animated version at the link below. If you click on, click on this YouTube link, there's actually an animated version of that story that was done by the Nuituan School. So the Nuituan School was a children's school right at Tomaquag Museum. It was grades K through eight, and they drew all of the pictures that are part of the animations for that story. And it's a really beautiful video. See if I can pull it up really quick so you can see. How birds got their song. Many moons ago, on Turtle Island, as we know Mother Earth is called, there were many living things. There were the two-legged and four-legged animals, lush greenery, and even the human beings. And they all got along together, the people as they were known. You'll definitely want to check that out. And that's always available on our YouTube page. So definitely look for that one. Let's see if I can go back to my presentation. and talk a little bit about birds. So birds are really important to our communities for lots of different reasons. One of which is because they're an important source of food. Who likes turkey on, on holidays? Turkey is delicious. Um, who's ever had goose? 
goose is very flavorful. Um, duck too, quail, partridge, grouse. If you live in the northernmost areas of North America, um, Alaska, and even way up in Canada, in the Arctic, that's where they have ptarmigan. And ptarmigan is said to be kind of like a chicken. Um, and also eggs. If you're an egg person, if you love eggs, even if you love to make cakes and pies, you know, eggs are useful for that stuff. So birds are an important food source and native people have been eating birds for a very long time. And we have some special recipes that feature these different birds. Um, you can try one of those recipes right here. Here is a link for a soba egg recipe. And so I hope you give it a try. If you do, let me know what you think of it. Send me a picture, I'd love to see. Here's a really cool fact. Did you know that turkeys originated in North America? The Spanish were the ones who brought it to Europe where it spread really quickly. Then early colonists brought it back to Eastern North America where it interbred with the wild turkeys that were already here. And that interbred version is what became the turkeys that we eat today, like this one that you're looking at. This turkey was my names. You wanna feed them? That beautiful tail feather. That's my cousin name right there. And Rain is an educator. He's an educator for um, early childhood. And he's a really great teacher. So turkey feathers. Turkey feathers could be used in clothing. Um, Native people, especially along the East Coast, made turkey feather mantles. And they were worn by both children and adults in the wintertime because they were very warm. And this particular mantle is actually a picture I took when I was at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum in Connecticut. And it's on display there now. When the museum is open, if you get a chance to visit, you'll definitely want to take a look at this gorgeous mantle. A lot of work goes into making these mantles. It's very intricate, the weaving that has to be done to hold each feather on. That's where the tradition of feather wrapping is included. One of the ways that it's used is in making these mantles. So I've included some links where you can learn more about feather mantle cloaks and see more pictures. Now, this link here has a lot of really great information. Might be a little bit older for older kids to understand and adults, but there's some definitely beautiful pictures that younger kids can see and see how they're made. And then here, there's some information about feather wrapping traditions and it also talks some about these feather mantles. So you definitely wanna check that out. So feathers are a part of our regalia. Our regalia not only represents the unique dancer and the style of dance that they, um, that they do, but also it's a part of their history. It represents their history of their family, their culture, their community. So it's not a costume and that's why we never talk about our traditional clothing, our regalia as costumes. In fact, that's a really rude thing to say to somebody who's native when they're wearing their traditional clothing. Never call it a costume, but show it respect and call it our regalia. Because a costume is something that you wear when you're dressing up and pretending to be something else. And that's not what we're doing at all. This, our regalia is a significant part of who we are. And it represents a lot of things that are important to us. And you will definitely see lots of different feathers in our regalia. And here are just a few examples. We have eagle plumes. We have, um, we have fan feathers. We have hawk um, and turkey. Lots of different types of feathers used in lots of different styles of dance. And there's a lot of information you can get out of how feathers are worn, how they look, the colors that are um, used to wrap them and adorn them, um, the way that they're cut, all of those things could tell you about a person's community, their family, their tribe, their clan. So feathers have a lot to do with our identity when we're wearing them in our regalia. Feathers are also utilized for our ceremonies, for our prayer and our healing, for honorings, 
and during our traditional dances. <laughs> Cayuga, there were some um, other Eastern Woodland dancers that were in there from other tribes, the Shinabe. Um, so lots of different people that were in this um, dance at the time. And the feathers that they're wearing, it's a part of that, um, it's a part of that ceremony, it's a part of that honoring. Our dances are healing. When we dance, we pray. When we dance, we're bringing blessings to our community. Um, so feathers are a part of that. When we use feathers in, in, in healing ceremonies or whether we're using them in dances, it's all meant to bring healing um, and connect us with our spirituality. And that's why feathers must always be treated with the utmost respect and care. In fact, when we have feathers, we want to keep them safe. And a lot of people have beautiful cedar boxes. And these boxes, made from cedar wood, are not just beautiful, but they're also really helpful because the smell of the cedar helps to keep away bugs and mites that might ruin the feathers. So whenever you have feathers, um, you have to take really good care of them. You have to store them properly. You want to air them out. Um, you have to clean them, make sure that there's no mites and things that can get in there because sometimes the mites, they're little bugs that are almost invisible and they chew and eat the feathers away. So you want to make sure that you're taking care of them well, cleaning them, washing them, grooming them um, so that you can have them for a really long time. They're very um, special to us. So you have to take care of them really well. And that's why one of the number one rules when you meet a native person and you see them in your regal their regalia, you don't touch. You never touch a person's regalia, especially the feathers, because not only is it rude and disrespectful, but the oils and the dirts in our hands can get into the feathers and ruin them. So we want to be really careful of that and really respectful of other people's traditions. Here are some great links to different traditional bird dance styles from all over Turtle Island. There's a Hopi Eagle dance, a women's fancy crow hop. There are traditional bird songs that come from California. There's a ladies doing the bird dance with those songs. Um, I really like this video about the traditional bird songs because it talks about how that community um, brought back those traditions to their community and how it did a lot of healing and help bring people together through that tradition and bringing those songs back. And they're absolutely beautiful songs. Um, then we have the World Chicken Dance uh, Championship. I think that's in, um, oh gosh, now it's skipped my head. It's in Canada. Um, but it's a really cool video. And they talk a lot about what the chicken dance means to them, why they do it, um, what, um, what are some of the components of it. So it's a really great video to check out. And then we have the Robin Dance. And this one is, is the Iroquois Nation, but Robin Dances were done by lots of different Native communities throughout the East Coast, um, including the Narragansett, including um, some tribes in Maine. There's variations and differences, but just wanted to give you a little idea of all of the different styles of dance that are pay, hom pay um, homage to birds um, and their importance in our culture. And these are some really great videos. So definitely take some time to check those out. So being gifted a feather is one of the greatest honors that you can receive. And it signifies the accomplishments that you've made. And it's a blessing to the bestower. I have my eagle feather that was gifted to me by my coworker when I started working in counseling. I worked for a program that counsels people with disabilities and helps them to become employed. And my coworker, her name is Geraldine Whiteman, and she's um, 
Oh goodness, she's an Anishinaabe and Crow? I can't even remember now. It's been a really long time, but she is such a special friend to me. And she gifted me this eagle feather and she beaded it using a peyote stitch. And I have kept this throughout my professional career and I've used it in talking circles. I've used it when I've done smudging ceremonies and when I've um, worked with clients and counseling, but I also now use it at the museum and I use it to educate people about our traditions and why these things are important to us. Um, and I take really good care of this feather. It's very special to me. It was my first eagle feather that was gifted to me. It's also something that we give to recognize other people. And you see that a lot in graduations and it's June. There's graduations happening all over. School is getting out, children are moving up, um, graduating from elementary schools and preschools and middle schools and high schools. And, and in our communities, we wanna honor them in the greatest way that we know how. And gifting a person an eagle feather is one of those traditions. Unfortunately, some schools don't understand those traditions that Native people hold. And so we can sometimes have a difficult time being given permission to show those, um, to show our traditions at our graduations. And there's been a lot of legal cases about that. And I've included some information about what eagle feathers mean when we're giving them as honorings and why we want to be able to wear them in graduations. And there's also some legal information here about that for people that may be having trouble with the school um, getting permission to do that. And this is ways that you can start to talk to the schools and negotiate so that you can incorporate those traditions if you're a Native person and you want to be able to do that for your children. Because it's really special. It's something that um, you'll never forget. And these are great accomplishments that these children have done and we wanna recognize them in the best way possible. So, if you want to learn more about feather wrapping traditions, there is a link right here that talks about it. I shared this link earlier on when I was talking about feather mantles, but this has a lot more information about feathers, what they mean in our communities, what the wrapping means, how we use it, how we do it, and techniques that you can use. There's also some advanced resources about how to take care of feathers, straightening and trimming them, and if you wanna do some feather wrapping, I have created a video that shows you a simple way that kids can learn how to do feather wrapping themselves. And here are the materials that you'll, um, you'll need. Um, actually, that's not the picture. Sorry about that. The picture is on, um, is on the resource guide. <laughs> um, but these are some wrapped feathers that we did at Children's Hour a couple of years ago. And here's a photograph of one of the children that were participating in that children's hour at the museum and making their own wrapped feathers. Um, you can get your own feathers to wrap. You might be lucky enough to find one outside, but you can also purchase them from craft stores. There's imitation feathers, and then there's um, duck and goose feathers that you can purchase because some feathers, um, are not allowed to be purchased. They're not allowed to be bought and sold. And there are some, some feathers, particularly eagle feathers, um, that can only be used by native tribes. We have permission from the federal government. We had to fight for that permission. Um, and the, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the act, the Native American Religious Freedom Act. I can't remember the exact name, but Native tribes fought for the right to be able to practice their traditional and spiritual ceremonies and to use things like eagle feathers and other traditional medicines um, and to be able to freely practice their spiritual beliefs. Okay, now I remember. It's the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. And that was in 1978 that we got permission um, that we went to court to fight for our rights um, to be able to practice our traditional religious beliefs, um, to be able to access sites that are spiritually important to us, to be able to possess and use sacred objects, including things like eagle feathers, um, and to be able to practice our ceremonies. We had to fight for the rights. So um, when you get to go to church or you get to pray or however you practice your religious freedom, Native people had to fight to, for the right to, um, to have their own spiritual beliefs. 
And that didn't happen until 1978, which isn't really a very long time ago. So eagle feathers are one of the things that we um, were granted permission to have. So you cannot buy an eagle feather. You're not allowed to own an eagle feather unless you are a native person. So be wary of trying to get an eagle feather from anybody because it's just not allowed. You would be breaking um, federal law if you were to do that. So be really careful about things like that. But there are lots of other feathers that you can enjoy. In fact, you can't go to the beach without finding a seagull feather. Um, and if you're taking walks in the woods, you'll probably find some others. So if you want to be able to make your own wrapped feather, there is going to be an instructional video link on our resource guide that will take you to another video where I show you how to make one yourself, like the one that Nikus made that he's holding right here. And it's very simple, uses just a few materials that you most likely have around your house. Um, and if you don't have a feather, you can try it on a stick so that you can make a wrap stick and learn the process of how you would um, how you would do a feather wrapping if you had a feather to use. So give it a try. And if you do, send me a video or a picture of what you created. I'd really love to see them. And if you want some different crafts to try, there's some really fun origami activities that I found some links for, and I share them here. Um, how to make origami birds and origami bird finger puppets. And you can make your own birds and maybe tell the story of how birds got their song with your own finger puppets. Um, and then because whenever we're doing a traditional art from another culture, it's important to learn about what that um, art form means and where it comes from. So I also shared a link about the origins of origami that's for kids. Um, to learn about where origami comes from, how it originated, and what it means in Japanese culture. So you can check that information out here. And then if you want more traditional stories about birds from all different native tribes, there's a really great link right here that has um, all kinds of different traditional stories from all different native tribes throughout um, North America that you can check out. And it has some resources for other books and things. And I also picked a few books that you might want to check out that were all written by indigenous authors. And all of these um, are books that come from um, Alaskan Native communities and um, Canada. So take a look at those. Uh, these are really fantastic books that talk about, um, that are different traditional stories about birds. So um, definitely check out these books and let me know what you think. And that's the end of this week's presentation. I hope that you enjoyed this children's hour. If you do the feather wrapping activity or if you make the soba head recipe, even if you just wanna um, tell me what you thought of the animated version of how birds got their song or any thoughts or, or um, questions that you may have, feel free to email me. Again, I always share my email address on our website on the resource guide and on this YouTube page in the comments. So um, I hope to hear from you and let me know what you created. I hope to see you again next week. Um, until then, Kishkanashni Tom.